There was a, a Hindu priest, a Jewish rabbi, and a TV evangelist. And uh, they were on a road trip to a convention because it was one of these interfaith things. And the car broke down in the country. So it's getting dark, so they see a light off in the distance. It's a farmhouse, so they start walking. And they walk up to the farmhouse, and they knock on the door. And they ask the farmer, look, there's three of us. Our trucks broke down out there on the road. Can we stay the night here on your place? And the guy says, yeah, sure. Glad to have you all, but there's only room for two in the house. There's three of you guys, and so one of you is going to have to stay out in the barn. And so the Hindu priest says, it's not a problem, I'll stay out in the barn, so fine, everybody starts to go to bed. <clears throat> About five minutes later, there's a knock on the door. It's the Hindu priest. He said, you know, I'm out there in the barn trying to sleep, and uh, there's a cow out there. And said, cows are sacred to Hindus, and so I'm not going to be able to stay in the barn, I've got to stay in the house. So the Jewish rabbi says, okay, I'll do it, I'll go out there. So, all right, lights go out, everybody goes back to sleep. <clears throat> About five minutes later, knock on the farmhouse door. Open the door to the Jewish rabbi. He said, well, I was planning on staying in the barn, you know, but there's a pig out there. And the thing of it is, is, you know, that's not kosher for the, for the Jewish people, and so I can't, I can't stay in the barn. So TV evangelist says, all right, you guys, all right, I'll go out there and stay in the barn. So he goes out to stay in the barn. Everybody turns off the lights, go, tries to go back to sleep. It's a knock on the door. They open the door. It's the cow and the pig. You gotta be smart to come to this church, <clears throat> catch those jokes. Uh, yep. Club 56, that's good, I would have forgot it. If you're in Club 56, time for you to go. There you go. Fantastic. You know, we need to get some video of what's going on in Club 56 so these other people know how good that is, so we can work on that. Luke 23. So, Here's the deal in the church calendar, if, you have any, if you're uh, from a liturgical church, you're kind of in one quasi-liturgical church. And that is, is that we follow the church calendar, and that is, is that this is the last Sunday in the season of Pentecost. Next Sunday is Advent Sunday. That starts the new church year. So if you've paid attention, the, we've, we've gone through the life of Jesus for a whole year. And uh, of course at Easter you go through the Passion and stuff like that. But in general, uh, Advent is about His coming and all that. We'll talk about that next week. So this is the last Sunday in the Gospels, so to speak. So here we are pretty much at the end of Gospel here on Luke, Luke 23, 33 through 43. When they came to the place called the Skull, they were uh, there they crucified Him uh, and the criminals, one on His right and the other on His left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they cast Lot, dividing up His garments among them, and the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at Him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offer him, offering him sour wine. And they were saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him saying, this is the king of the Jews. You've got to be thinking here. Luke's trying to tie king and Savior together. So just keep that in mind here. One of the criminals who was hanging there was hurling abuse at Jesus, saying, You are not the Christ. Save yourself and save us. But the other criminal answered and rebuked him and said, Don't you even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. So, I want to talk about winning in the dark 
when things get really bad, endure. That's kind of what I want to talk about today. The context of this scripture here is a description of the darkest day that this planet has ever known. This is a day of cosmic ramifications, the day that God died, the day the evil won, the day in which all of history hinges, surpassed only by a better day, the day of Jesus Christ's resurrection. But this day is when all seemed to fall apart. All of it seemed to be a lie, a day when all hope was lost. It seems that the whole thing had been a cruel joke. We had thought that the Scriptures were true. We had thought that the Messiah was going to come save us and deliver us. We had thought that Jesus was the new King David. We had thought He would deliver us from the pagan powers that oppress us. And we had thought He was going to deliver us from the power of Satan, the evil one. But no, doesn't seem like that happened. He prophesied last week about this great temple being torn down, not one stone left upon the other, and yet there stands the temple in all its glory, and here He hangs on a cross. Once again, once again, what we always knew to be true is the old has squashed out any hope that anything might be new or might change on this planet. All this talk about God doing a new thing, these miracles that happened, this hope that was put in us, this thinking about new creation, all of it, nothing but a cheap magician's trick. But there was a few things that they missed. Isaiah had told them, if they'd have been paying attention, that their Messiah must suffer for their sins. Had they read Isaiah, they would have found out that there was a whole four chapters about the suffering servant and that this suffering servant must take their place. And they missed that part. Instead of the whole group of them, the whole people group of them dying for their sins, one champion, one man among them, the strongest among them, was going to stand up and take the hit that all of them deserved. They missed that part. Yes, he was a king, but he was the king that would pay with his own life so that the evil powers would not enslave his people any longer. As C.S. Lewis tells us in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there was a deeper magic at work that they couldn't see. Indeed, there was a deeper theology at work And standing where we do, on this side of the cross, on this side of resurrection, we can see the beauty of it all, though we lose sight of it. And that's why it's good to deal with these harder pieces of Scripture. But on our side of it, on a good day, when our spirit is full of God's Holy Spirit, when we're prayed up, when we're we're on our game, you know, we see the victory of God. We see that evil reared back, wound up like the old Popeye, bam, and gave Jesus all it could. All of hell's power was released on this man, and our champion stood, saw it coming, took the hit, and died. But on our side of it, we know that a few days later he rose again, never to die again, and thus opening the way to what this second criminal says when he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. He's not talking about some fluffy cloud with naked little angels shooting love arrows. He's talking about God's garden. He's talking about new creation, new heaven and new earth where I'm going to live, where you guys are going to live. It's this planet rebuilt. No more pollution. No more disease. No more tears. No more more unsustainability. All that stuff. 
And, and so we know on this side of it that, that, that Jesus paid the way so that not only this second criminal, but me could go to God's garden. And that I will rise again. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. No man gets to the Father except through me. On this side of the cross, I see that. On this side of the cross, I put my trust in that. My hope and my faith. I'm not just a Christian today because I, I need to be good so that my wife will like me. Right? Let's get real about it. No, there's a greater reward than just being a nicer guy because I practice the way of Christianity. It's that I will rise again. And so, Jesus made the way for that. But before the victory, and we love to talk about the victory, but before the victory came the death, and came darkness, and came defeat, and came utter hopelessness, and, the, and it was darkest before the dawn. So why does all this matter to you and me today? Because you and me are still involved in a struggle against evil. The same struggle that Jesus the Christ was involved in, you and I are also involved in. That's why it matters to us today. The same evil powers that killed Him are still loose and are still trying to kill you. And so that's why we come to church. That's why we join a church. That's why we come into the community of faith because you cannot stand alone. These voices, these powers, they're strong. Matter of fact, Ephesians 6 says this, your struggle is not against flesh and blood. Your struggle is not against that, that other human who hates you. For whatever reason, they hate you. That's not your struggle. Your struggle is against rulers and powers of wickedness in heavenly places that are pulling those people's chains. Listen, a lot of people have dangling chains out there. Little dangling chains off of them. And all the devil has to do is jerk one of those chains when he wants to put the pain on you. Just pulls their chain and they take it out on you. Mm. And as long as you're in, on this planet, you're going to be involved in a warfare that originates not from the natural sphere, but from the supernatural sphere, the parallel universe. These forces of darkness are against you and they are against your family. And they're against anything that you're trying to do with God and move yourself forward. All right? And they're powerful in their influences. And their goal is to keep you in bondage and not allow the freedom that Jesus won on that resurrection day to touch you. To keep you in bondage. And so let me tell you, there will be dark days in your life as a Christian. And when uh, days when it looks like all hope is lost, days when it looks like the evil has won in your life and in your family, days when it looks like the whole thing with Jesus has been a cruel joke. A cruel joke. Nothing ever changes. Nobody really ever gets deliverance from addictions. Nothing good really, really ever happens in this life. Just the same old story of evil and worldly powers and sickness winning. That is the, that is the thing that will bombard you time and time and time again. All you got to do is watch the news. If you watch the news, that's the message. Nothing ever changes. Evil always wins. We, we got nine bad news stories and maybe one good news story tacked on the end so that you'll turn it on next, next day or something like that. So what do you do on days that look like that? What do you do in seasons that last longer than a day, that last longer than a week, that last longer than a month, where it seems like the darkness is winning, when it looks like all is lost? What do you do? How do you survive as a Christian and not give up on your faith in dark seasons? And I just have to tell you, there's people giving up on their faith all the time. And matter of fact, uh, I, I don't remember the brother's name, but he was a famous pastor just about a couple months ago, came out, he's a California guy, had written some books, been influential in the 1990s, and, he, and, he, and he'd been a pastor, and he, and he just he, he wrote the book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, so me can Google him or whatever. And he just basically said I was wrong. 
Uh, I, I have to quit being a Christian. I, the, the, the only honest thing, he's honest anyway. He says, I see what the Christian faith requires and I can't do it. And I quit being a Christian. That's what he said. And then I have some friends from Melbourne, Australia. And uh, they tell me that uh, in a post-Christian culture that is several layers removed from us, let me give you an example, a uh, man on the street interview, if you ask people here in America, could I pray for you? Uh, nine, roughly nine out of ten, I think, around here, Central Texas, they'll say, yeah, pray for me. You know, if they're really hurting, yeah, pray for me. These guys tell me in Australia, in Melbourne, it's the exact opposite. Nine out of ten will say, don't, don't even try that stuff on me. Okay, so that's a dark place. And my friend Mark, he's a pastor down there, he said, you know, I was this close to quitting because I got people that work at places in Australia and they are so persecuted in the workplace for being a person of faith that they want to go underground, they want to hide, they want to go in the closet with their faith. And he said, it's so depressing. He says, I didn't, at one point in my life, and he's about, he's in his 40s, he said, I didn't know one pastor in the whole continent of Australia that was my age that hadn't quit the ministry. So, so what do you do when the darkness is real strong? What do you do? How do you win in dark times? And, and this is the answer. We win the same way Jesus won. We look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we do it the way He did it, because that's the only way you're going to do it. You know, do you realize... That Jesus is the commander of the armies of heaven. He's not like just a sergeant, you know, in that army. He's the commander of the Lord of hosts. So this tells me that Jesus is like a 10th degree black belt in spiritual warfare. I mean, he could whip you about 150 different ways before you could say, help me. So Jesus is a 10th degree black belt. And at best, we're white belts. First day in the dojo, learning something. Right? So that doesn't mean that we got to lose. But it does mean that we can't rely on our own smarts to win these kind of battles. We got to look to the 10th degree black belt and say, how do I win? This, you know how to win. You are the commander of the armies of heaven, how do I win? And so, there's three things, three themes that came out this week as I'm studying this thing. And Jesus sets the pace here. The first thing that I see on this is that Jesus did not let trouble separate Him from the Father. Think about this a minute. Romans says nothing. And so that's point one. We're up there. Good. we got Patricia on that thing. Romans says, nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus, but I can voluntarily separate. It's true. I can renounce Him. I can walk away. Jesus did the opposite. On His darkest day, and this is His darkest day, He still calls God His Father. That's an intimate term. That's not like, hey, great commander, you know, this kind of distance thing. No. He calls Him Father. He says, Father, forgive Him. He never quit calling Him Father. He never let the darkness come between Him and Father. Now, He did feel abandoned. The other Gospel, it says, Father, why have you forsaken me? He's still calling Him Father. Why have you forsaken me? He feels abandoned. There are days we feel abandoned. Is that right? See, if you only have the candy-coated Gospel... The gospel of only happy, happy, happy. You're going to be in serious trouble in dark times. Serious trouble. The truth is, the gospel does its best work on dark days. That's where you see the power of the gospel. I mean, a lot of things can make me happy. A lot of money can make me happy. Good health can make me happy. There's a, Jesus can make me happy. And if we're not careful, good health, good job, a lot of money, kids okay, Jesus, all the same. All these things make just Jesus is just another thing to make me happy. That's the candy-coated gospel. 
Mm -hmm. But what we're talking about is, is a power that's deeper than happy. It's not a worldly power. It's a supernatural power. And many times you and I will not see the value of it until all the worldly stuff is taken away or shown for what it is. It's when the darkness is so intense and you've lost it all that you see the immense value of the kingdom of God. And there's nothing in the world that can take the kingdom of God from you if you have asked Jesus to be your king. And the gospel says it's like a pearl of great price that a pearl merchant finds that thing and he goes and he sells everything to buy that one pearl. It's, the, the gospel say he's a guy plowing in a field and his plow hits a treasure box of hair, a buried treasure and he goes, oh man, and he goes and sells his house, he sells everything and buys that field so he can get that treasure box. That's what the kingdom is like. That's what the gospel say the kingdom is like. But on dark days, when your emotions are telling you, where is God in all this? Praise God for the Bible. There is not one problem you could run into that you can't find an answer for in the Bible. Let me give you an example. Job's friends. Job is having one heck of a dark season in his life. I don't have time to preach the whole book. But his friends come around. They're from church. There's church friends. I guess. And in the end, they say, curse God and die, Job. There's just no other hope here for you. What a pack of friends that is. No. It's the exact opposite. Don't curse God and die. Hold on and call on the name of the Lord. Call on your Father who can deliver you. In many instances, God puts us in these situations to burn away the useless stuff in our lives. You know? He wants to make us useful and not useless. But so much in our lives keep us bound to uselessness in the kingdom. Wrong focuses, wrong uh, investment of time, energy, and money. Useless, really, to the things that matter. Dark days expose useless junk for what it is. And the thing to do is jettison the junk and grab Father like never before. Uh, I worked for almost 10 years at, a, at another church in Austin, and they had a guy, he was a friend of the pastor. He was a lawyer from Virginia. I forget his first name, but he taught finance seminars. He's kind of like the Dave Ramsey. He wasn't that famous. He didn't have a radio show or anything, but of the 80s. Uh, and the thing of it was is, is that how he got there was is that uh, he had been in a lot of business ventures, and this guy was what you would call a cultural Christian. In other words, a cultural Christian, whether they're really born again or not, I don't know. But they think God's okay. They go to church. They look good. It's the horizontal self. They look real good on the side. But down inside, they're playing their own game. They're, they're doing their own thing. That's what he was doing. He was wheeling and dealing. He was, had his money here, had his money there, had his money, well, this, well... Big old mess, big old recession hit in the early 80s and he lost everything and he found himself somewhere in a neighborhood, I can't remember, maybe Mr. Brown can remember, somewhere in a neighborhood of $5 million in debt. And uh, dark, dark time. Foreclosed, lost everything. That brother grabbed on to God. I don't know if he was a Christian before the crisis, but after the crisis, he was. And that guy grabbed hold to God. And so when I met him, when, when, when he came and he was doing this touring seminar, he was, he was preaching out of brokenness. And he was preaching out of what God taught him as he was a broke man. And in his town, he said he had been the big shot, he'd been the big wheel, everybody knew him. He was a divorce lawyer, made all his money off divorces. And he said after this crisis happened, he said people uh, not only didn't like him, but they would call him names, they, they would uh, ridicule him in the pray papers and everything. And one lesson he learned is don't be a divorce lawyer. Be on God's side of it and start trying to put marriages back together. But anyway, God told him, you're going to pay every one of those people back. And so he would get up every morning and he said, everything in me felt horrible. Emotionally, I felt like slime. But I would get out of bed and I would force myself to sing the praises of the Most High God. 
And he said, I'm going to work today. And he went to every creditor and he sat down with them. Most of them didn't want to meet with him. He sat down with them and he says, I know I owe you $150,000, sir. Pull out his wallet, says, here's $5. That's all I got today, but I vow to you, I'm going to pay it off. Here's five. And when I get more, I'll be back. And I think this process took him like 12 years. But he paid every one of those people back. But the thing of it was is, he became a new man because of it. And he became a follower of Jesus, and he learned how to fight the way Jesus fights through the thing. So it's important to let dark times give way to new spiritual practices. You see, the brother had new spiritual practices as he was going through this dark battle. And I want to tell you, the reason, one, reason, one byproduct of the battle is that God is trying to take you deeper and He's trying to expose you to some new practices in your life. So don't be surprised if you get into a dark battle and the stuff that you've always done is somewhat ineffective. The idea is for you and I to call on God and to say, oh God, what do I got to do here to change what's going on in me? And so when the heat gets turned up, you may need to start fasting a day a week or two days a week or something. You may incorporate fasting in your life. You may need to incorporate daily speaking in tongues. What was that about? Well, it's about if you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, and you ask the Holy Spirit to come into your life, and you open your whole life to the Holy Spirit, you have the ability to speak in tongues. And it's, and it's different from the public speaking in tongues. We don't have time to go into a teaching on that. But it is a devotional language, the language of the Holy Spirit given to you for supernatural outbreak and power. And I was over with these Germans in Bastrop last month in October teaching them. And they said, we, uh, we start our mornings singing and speaking in tongues for 20 minutes straight. And we see the power of God released in our lives over here. I thought, man, that's exciting. Maybe incorporating praise music in your life. It, 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 I don't know. You know, God's going to show you. If you're in a dark battle, God's going to show you. What needs to change? Anyway, that's the first thing. He never let the trouble separate him from Father. The second thing is, he never forgot his mission. This is, this is interesting. Even on the darkest day, Jesus never let go of his vocation. He was indeed the king of the Jews and the savior of the world. Both of those two things together. And his mission was to save. To save, that's it. And four times in this passage, the word save is used. Uh, save yourself. Save us. If you're so great, save yourself. Save yourself. All that kind of stuff. His mission was Savior. And while they're mocking at him and making fun of him to save himself, he was actually saving the world. He was doing it. You know, and you really see it when he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. This is the role of the Savior. This is the role of Messiah, the leader of the people, to ask forgiveness of the people for sins done in ignorance. This goes back to the Old Testament. There were sacrifices for all kinds of sins, and there's a certain sacrifice for sins that you did unknowingly. How many can thank God for that? And that's what he's saying is, He's saying, Father, they think they're doing the right thing. They're actually doing the exact opposite of the right thing. Forgive them for being ignorant. That's what he's doing. He's being the Messiah. He's being the Savior while he's tacked up on the cross. Amazing. And there's three groups of people in this passage. There's one group that's openly hostile to him. The Romans, the Jewish leaders, and the first criminal. That's one group. There's a second group called the people. And they're neutral. They're just standing there watching. Wow. They're watching. And they're neutral. They don't know. They're not really openly hostile, but they're not really on his side. They're just, they're neutral. And then there's favorable. 
the second criminal. In the middle of the thing, everybody's witnessing exactly the same event. The second criminal gets it. And he says, remember me. And I think it's beautiful. Because let me tell you, you don't end up on a Roman cross without being a pretty bad guy. And it's funny, this guy doesn't have to go down his list of sins and say, well, I raped this woman and stole this money and killed this guy and I'm an enemy of the state and that's why I'm getting killed. He doesn't do that. He just says, Jesus, save me, basically. And in the middle of him being mocked, Jesus saves him. He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's how quick it can happen. See, the devil tries to tell you, oh man, you got to go through six months of penance and you got to do this and you got to do that and you, you got to do, you got to pay back $12 million. I don't know. To call, today, call on the name of Jesus. Anyway, it's interesting that all three of these groups, the openly hostile, the neutral, and the favorable, are all candidates of paradise, God's garden. They are all still candidates, and how will they choose? And he's asking for pardon for the killers that they might open their eyes to see and they might choose the right way. And we have a record of that in the other Gospels where one of the Roman soldiers, the very ones who killed him, got on his knees and says, this guy was the Son of God. We have that record. And then secondly, we see the fulfillment of this mission as the second criminal finds salvation at the last minute of his life. So hanging there, tortured on the cross, Jesus is still moving the mission of salvation forward. He doesn't allow the darkness to silence him. He keeps it going forward. And this is the temptation when we are in the dark, dark, dark days. Is that we actually forget the mission. Because we get all focused on ourselves. On what's not working for us. And you begin to doubt and, and hesitate to tell others and to pray for others, and to be on mission with God when all the darkness is on you because you kind of start thinking, darn it, if this is how God treats His friends, I'm not sure I want to tell anybody about this. <laughs> right? Can I get a witness up in here? And so if the extent of your gospel is the candy-coated gospel, then you will forget the mission at this point, and you will not offer the kingdom because you'll be shaking yourself and you'll be in doubt. Let me tell you, you can't take anybody further than who you are. Mister, you want to lead your family in a godly direction, you better get up on a horse and lead them then. And if you look at the miserable state that they're in or whatever, you got to look at you. Because you, your company, whatever, whoever you're leading, your classroom, whatever, you can't lead people where you're not. And if you're dissatisfied with where the, where the followers are, then go look in the mirror and say, help me, Jesus. Right? Let the darkness push you further into God, not away. So the goal is not only to survive this dark season, or this dark day, or this dark year, this transition, but the goal is to actually finish well. So what does finishing well look like? It means enduring all the way to the end of your life. Not just having one big uh, spiritual high back in the 19 teens or 20 teens or, you know, whatever. Oh boy, I remember when I was really on fire for God, but I'm really not there anymore. That's not the goal. The goal is to just keep going, to keep going forward. And so what does finishing well look like? Real fast, kind of three things. You love Jesus more at the end of your life than you did when you first met Him. Amen. Secondly, you're more interested in Jesus' agenda at the end than you are at the beginning. Yeah. And then thirdly, that you sacrifice more of your time, your money, and your energy towards Jesus' agenda rather than your own. So there's a lot of powerful forces trying to get you to not finish well. And you kind of got to decide right now how you're going to end up. You can't wait till that dark day and then to decide, am I going to quit? And I'm going to be like this guy in California and say, I, was, I can't hack it, I quit Christianity. You got to decide now that no matter how dark it comes, I'm never going to quit. Jesus, I'm never going to quit. Now, I don't know... If y'all are cultured enough to know who Jerry Clower is. Jerry Clower. The, t the Mississippi talker. Can I get it? Does anybody know who Jerry Clower is? 
he's a country boy from Mississippi. And he said he was so country, he didn't even know how to play football. And he said he showed up at Ole Miss, I believe it was. And they said, you're a big old country boy. I said, uh, I believe we need to you on a football team. He said, well, I'll be glad to see what that's about, but I don't know what it's about. I said, well, look here, fella. Here's a football. They handed it to him, and they said, run, run down there. And it's going to be about 11 guys trying to, tackle, trying to knock that ball out of your hand and try to tackle you. He said, oh, yeah, that all there is to it. And so he just took off running. And they said, boy, you're going to be the starting running back for us down here. And so he said, uh, when asked, he said, what is your position? He said, I don't know my position, but I am the man what runs with the football. And he said, I'm going to tell you something about running with the football. He said, no matter how many of them come against you and they finally do get you down, the goal of it is, is for your head to be leaning into the right direction. You're trying to go that way. You didn't quite make it because 15 guys jumped on, well, 11 jumped on you. I was thinking about rugby or something, right? But my head is pointed towards the goal. Right? And I'm thinking about some people in my life that haven't forgot the mission. And as a matter of fact, even when they don't feel like the mission, they get up and go do the mission. And I've seen a change in their life over the years as they have engaged in the mission of salvation on the planet. Hey, listen, there's always something to be uptight about. Something ain't working right. But to say there's a bigger calling, and, a, and, and that is really the point of the whole thing of praise and even that speaking in tongues stuff I was telling you about. Your default position has to be a worshiper at the, at the foot of the throne of God. If that's who you are, you're a worshiper. Let me tell you something. You're always welcome there. I don't care what hell's breaking loose. You're always welcome there. And if that's your starting point, if that's where you start, that's your default position, that's your foundation, you can't lose. You can't lose. The mission. So we don't always do it right, right? I had this guy that was giving me a hard time. Matter of fact, he was going to take me to court. And uh, it was a nasty situation. He was my neighbor. And uh, I told my uncle about it. My uncle was an Episcopal priest. And I said, man, there's this guy giving me the business. I said, I just can't stand to look at him. And I'm a Christian. I know that ain't right, but I just can't stand this guy. Hey, this guy is a horse's rear end cubed, man. And uh, you know my Episcopal uncle said? He had the audacity to tell me. He says, uh, well, I'm going to pray that God show you a way to bless that man's life. I don't, bless no, but I don't want to bless his life. Guy was going through a separation from his wife because of this trouble. And, uh, and I mean, he was in a bad way. And we all know hurting people hurt people, right? Yeah. Sometimes when people hurt you, uh, it's because they are yucky on the inside kind of deal. And I knew some of that was going on, but it, it didn't matter. I still didn't like him. So it's a February day. His wife's left him. He's my neighbor. And we kind of live down the country. But from my window, I could see his place over there. And I seen him out there, and he let his grass grow real tall. February grass is all dead, real tall. He's out there with a push mower, trying to push that, cut through that junk, you know. Had coat on. And I'm looking at that guy at a distance, and I'm going, man. And I heard God tell me those words from my uncle. How could I bless this guy? And immediately the Holy Spirit told me, Get your tractor over there and mow the guy's deal. Mm. Man, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be perceived as a friend. <laughs> but I do know not to disobey the Lord. My, it might take me a couple days to get my attitude right, but I am going to do what God tells me to do no matter what. So when fired up the lawn tractor, went over there. Pulled the mower part of it on. Boom, boom, it starts whirling. He looks up. He's all scared. I said, get out of the way. <laughs> Mowed the whole deal. He tries to have a conversation with me. I just drove it after I was done. I said, see ya. Boom. Doing God's will. But you know what happened? That broke the back of it. And uh, that, that boy became like a puppy. And God got a hold of him, and he got his family back. He got his kid back. Started coming to my church. It was amazing. 
He's since moved on, but it, it, it was an amazing thing. It was a powerful thing to me that in the midst of the darkness, don't forget the mission. Amen. Then the last thing is this, is that in the end, when the chips are down, you know, we can trust Scripture and we can trust the promises of God and all this kind of stuff, but in the end, the key word there is trust because we don't have it in our hand yet. So really, I see Jesus simply trusting. He put it all into the hands of Father. And he knew he was doing the right thing. He knew that his vocational calling as Messiah would end in crucifixion. He knew that. We can pick that up from the Scriptures. And he knew that deliverance would come through the cross, not around it. He knew that stuff. And he'd been tempted in the wilderness in chapter 4 of Luke to go the easy way, the world's way. But he shunned that and he moved forward in a real sense. And But you've got to realize those are real temptations. Jesus really could have made the wrong choice there. But he really won the battle, I think, in the wilderness when he was out there for 40 days. Another reason for fasting. He wasn't fasting to weaken himself. He was fasting to strengthen himself so that when the devil came, he could stand against him. That's the way I see that. But he was born the king of the Jews, and as such, he had to go to the cross in order to be their legitimate king. And he knew that. But he did not have any real guarantee how the thing was going to work out. He did not know how much it was going to hurt. It's never been done. He did not know what resurrection would entail, because it had never been done. And nobody had ever gone through this. And I don't care how many times you watch The Passion of the Christ by Mel, the Mel Gibson produced or directed movie, that's one thing. It's another thing to actually have somebody nail something through your arm. So there's just no, no guarantee that this deal's going to end up working the way I think it's going to work. So he simply has to trust Father. He had to enter the darkness of death and hope that it was true that there was life on the other side. And this is really the case for you and me as well. In these dark battles we face, and if you know you're in the right, and you've prayed and all this stuff, but you, you're still in it, everything around you looks like it might be wrong. But we have to trust that what we've heard in the light, we're not going to doubt in the dark. Amen. You know? So if our actions are biblical and in accordance with the revealed will of God, and if those in spiritual authority over us agree that we're in the right place, then we simply move forward. And in the end, we just have to leave it to God and trust. Trust that it's going to work out. And the truth is, we need a miracle for things to turn out right in these situations. Hey, man, we're fixing to go into the holiday season right here. Let's just talk straight here. Let's, like, let's talk like those New Yorkers. We got some New York friends. They said, this is crusty talk. Let's talk crusty. You fixing to enter into uh, and bump into some folk you don't really like, but you're related to them in some cases. And so, you know, um, you need a miracle. You need a miracle to get through this holiday meal or this holiday season or encountering Uncle Joe or whatever. You're going to need a miracle if God's going to do anything good in that situation. Am I talking crusty? It's so wrong. It's so dark. It's so deceptive. These people are completely deceived by the devil. If, if, if I told them the sky is blue, they would say, you just said the sky was green. Have you ever met anybody that's that deceived? Man, I have. I heard you say it. You said the sky was green. I said, nope. I said the sky was blue. That's deception. Deception is so deceptive. <laughs> Only God can fix it. Only God can fix it. You need a miracle. Yep, that's the deal. Only God can bring good out of this dark place. And we have to do what he told us to do and let him do the miracle working part of it. So the promise that God gave us in the light has to be trusted in the dark. So I'm going to end with this story. It's a true story. Is that back in about, oh, 
2 or 03. I was in a battle, a dark battle, for the adoption of my son. And things were not going the way they needed to go. So I went on a 12-day fast on behalf of my son and on behalf of what righteousness looked like and on right situations. And I'm on day nine of this fast, and I'm driving out in the western hill country because I'm going to end my, my 12-day fast with a three-day deal out in my tent, out in my camper, just me and Jesus. And I'm, I'm, this is about 02 or 03. And back in those days, I would listen to teaching tapes by Jack Hayford, cassette tapes. Yeah, what are those? Um, and the reason I would listen to these tapes is because I was tr because as a senior pastor, you have to preach every week like this. Like, I really get a kick out of these, and I love our missionaries, but a good missionary only has to come up with one or two sermons a year because they go to all these different churches, and they just they know that that sermon works, and it works, and hallelujah. But when you're a preaching pastor, you've got to come up with a sermon every week. And so I was trying to train myself, even though I'd been a youth pastor for about 10 years, and I always came up with youth teachings every week, but I had to train myself. It was really a different thing into, into how to be a preacher every week. And so I would listen to, to mentors, and Jack Hayford was a good one for sure. And I was listening to this tape, and I'm driving out on, on uh, Bandera Highway out there, and I don't know when Jack Hayford preached the sermon that I was listening to, but I'm listening to it in about 2003, and I think he preached it probably in the 1970s. And he's in the middle of preaching, and I'm listening to it on tape. I'm driving my truck down the road, and he says this, What you are asking of God, God says, right now, it is done. And I mean, it was the voice of God to me. It is finished. I have seen your fasting, I have seen your prayers, and you have won. And I, it blew me. I, I was like, wow. A guy can preach that in 1978. I'm in 2003 listening to a cassette, and, it's still, and it is exactly the Word of God to me. I mean, you know the difference between you just hear a sermon and that was God's Word? I still finished the other three days. I probably shouldn't have, but I did just because I'm... Some kind of commando guy, I think. So anyway, I tried. It. I did that. But sure enough, that, that the back was broken of the resistance, and things started moving in the right direction at that point. So, so in the end, you got to just trust God. So that's kind of the thing. I, I just want to pray for you. So let's just close our eyes real quick. You know, I, I'm convinced that I'm talking to some folks that are in a tough, a tough place today. And you know, the first thing I would say to you is if you haven't done it, you need to come to Jesus. Amen. A lot of times God puts us in dark places to run out the end of our own strength. And you've got to surrender. And you've got to come to Jesus just as I am. Just as I am, without one plea, that the Son of God would die for me. You know, you just come to Jesus and say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus to be my King. I need him to be my leader and my forgiver. So that would be the first thing that I would say. The other thing I would say if you're in a dark battle today is there's one word for you. Endure. Just don't quit. Are you going to do it right? I don't know. Just don't quit. The wrong thing to do is quit. You may not do everything perfectly. You're a white belt and you're calling on the 10th degree black belt to help you fight. There may be some miscommunication in there. Just endure. And then the last one is, is that God brought you here today to, bring, to give you hope. To give you hope. And my blessing at the end of this thing after communion is going to be that for you, to get hope. So nobody looking around. Let's just close our eyes. You say, I need Jesus today. Would you raise your hand? I need Jesus. And so, you know, call on Him. Call on the name of the Lord. Right where you are right now, say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, I need you. We have prayer teams up here at the end after communion. Come up and talk to them about it. It's a very personal thing, but come up and talk to them about it. I want to pray for you. You need to endure. Raise your hand. You're in the middle of the heat, man. The heat is on. Lord, for those that are standing, they've put on the armor of God. We've done all to stand. When you've done all to stand, just stand some more. 
Lord, I bless them with power to stand right now. Stand. Continue to do the right thing. Continue to forgive. Continue to hope that God can do miracles. God will do miracles. You had not seen them yet today, but you know what? I just declare today that the backbone of the power of that thing is broken. It's a whimpering little... It's still gasping. It's still barking at you a little bit, but those are the death gasps of a thing that's dying because you have won the victory. I bless you with that today. And for all those that need hope, Romans 15, 13. I'm going to read it at the end right after communion. But I pray that as you take the sacrament, the bread and the juice, that hope starts running through your body right now. Matter of fact, there's broken parts of our bodies that we're calling on healing today. There are emotional problems in our lives that we are calling for healing today as we take the sacrament. We believe that the Holy Spirit infuses the bread, infuses the juice, and fills us with new resurrection life even while we're in this old life. And that's why we come to the table of the Lord. It is a precursor to the wedding supper of the Lamb where we will feast in new creation and there won't be any reason to cry out to God because there won't be any problems and God will be right there. He'll be right there sitting across the table from you. Hallelujah. That's where our hope is. Amen. So we're going to do communion. We're going to share communion here. And um, it says in the Word, we know this, that Jesus became sin to connect us with the Holy God. And John's first point about we don't have to allow sin to separate, anything to separate us from the love of God because He became sin. But we, sometimes we let our sin do that. We let our sin stand in the way between us and Jesus. And that's what we celebrate at communion today. And it doesn't have to be complicated to to run back to Jesus. Um, and, and Jesus says that in his in the, the most perfect prayer, and that's what we're going to do today. We're just going to say the Lord's Prayer together. So if y'all would stand up, we're just going to say the Lord's Prayer. It's just one small line of it that says, forgive us our trespasses, and he moves on with the rest of the prayer. It doesn't have to be hard. It's just simple. So let's say this perfect prayer together before we take the, um, it's not this one, sorry, Patricia, it's the Our Father, the uh, Lord's Prayer. Go ahead and say it together. We know it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Just in that prayer. That's an amazing prayer. All right, so we're going to um, have the ushers come on up and they're going to dismiss you row by row. You're going to take the bread and the juice and um, you're going to take it back to your seat and then we're going to pray over the elements and worship a little bit and then we're going to pray over them together and take them. So go ahead and do that. Tiffany and Russell Blackstone that are going to pray over the elements for us. Lord God, we just humbly come before you, Jesus, praising you as our creator, as our savior, as the source of peace, the good shepherd, God, our most high king, Lord God. We're just so grateful, Jesus, for what you did on the cross, that, Lord, you loved us so much that you sent him, God pay the penalty and the punishment for our sin, and that because of your resurrection that we can now be in your presence, God, you clothed, clothed us with your robes of righteousness. We just thank you, God, that we can be before you, praising you, Jesus, casting every just care, everything that we have, Lord, before you, God. We just thank you for that, Jesus. We just pray right now, Lord, that as we're going to be around just people, family, and friends this week, God, some that may not know you, God, I just pray, Father, that you would empower and embolden us, God, to just share that hope that we have, God, with them, 
that they would just see our lives as so winsome, God, that they would just be wanting to see and to know what we have, Lord, because of you, what you have done for us, God. We just thank you for that, Jesus. Let's take the breath. So our prayer teams are going to be up here, but here's what I promised you, and I think this has some power to it. You guys just stay right here a second. This is what I want to bless you with. So if you want a blessing, need some hope, kind of act like you're going to get a whole wheelbarrow full of it here. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Receive it. We take it. In the name of Jesus, we receive it. So this week's going to be full of hope. So God bless you and whatever your assignment is this week, whoever you, you engage on Thanksgiving and all that kind of stuff, um, God bless you. You are God's uh, agent. Uh, you're going to do it right You're going because you and Jesus are going to do it together and traveling or whatever hope hope that God's right with you nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus it's going to be a good week we'll see you back here next Sunday for the first Sunday in Advent so we're starting a new year next week so God bless you our prayer teams are up here come get some prayer and let's be dismissed